Well, welcome everybody to Traffics and the DevOps Meetup uh, Amsterdam for December. Uh, for those of you that don't know about Traffics, uh, Traffics is an online travel agency. Uh, we operate through the brands Cheap Tickets, uh, Fayama, Budget Air, Vliegwinkel, a couple of others. Um, we're now open in 38 countries. We have eight offices around the world. Uh, this is the head office, and on this floor, most of the software uh, that we run on is developed and, uh, and maintained. And our first speaker <coughs> is Donovan Brown. So, All right. so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Donovan Brown. I am responsible for the DevOps vision on top of Team Foundation Server and on top of Visual Studio Team Services all up at Microsoft. Because I install Alassian's tools, I install Jenkins, I install Bitbucket, I install all of these different tools, and I use them figure out what makes them good so that I can go back and make our products great because I'm competitive and I do not like to lose. If you think there is a tool out there after I show you what we have today that does a better job than what I've just shown you, that is my Twitter handle. <laughs> I am dead serious. You tweet at me anything that you think that we can do better and I will either figure out a way to do it myself or add someone else from Microsoft to that tweet that can go make that happen for you. I've actually pushed a production fix to a build server for a person who was having trouble with a build for mobile. He tweeted me three hours later, we had a hot fix pushing to production to fix that person's problem. I am that serious about it. Guy asked me a question the other day, I said, that's a better question for Azure, hold on. Hold on two Azure guys, go fix this for this guy. Microsoft needs to be more engaged with their customers than we've ever been before, because our competitors are engaged. And we found that there was a gap there. So myself and several other PMs at Microsoft were very, very active on Twitter. And if you follow me and ask me a question, what was it happened today, and it's a beautiful thing. I love when this happens. Someone asked me a question. Before I could get there, one of my followers already answered the guy. So you can use it not only to get answers, but also to get things changed inside of Microsoft. Okay, so at Donovan Brown. So what are you going to do today? We're going to define DevOps as it is at Microsoft, so that every time I say it going forward, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we're going to be like level set. So it's, I'm sure everyone out here has heard a different definition of DevOps. That's fine but we're going to agree on one before we continue the rest of the de uh, demonstration. I am going to give you an end-to-end -end demo of everything that we have here at Microsoft. I call this one Zero to DevOps because I literally start with a blank desktop. No code, no pipeline, no build, no release, nothing in Azure, absolutely nothing, zero. But by the time I'm done, we're going to have all of those things. We're going to have a build, a release, running all the way into Azure, source code, Git repo, the whole nine yards. And I'm just going to show you just how quickly I can start from nothing and spin this stuff up. This is the definition that we run with at Microsoft. It's really important for me to understand why is DevOps so hot? So why in the world are we talking about DevOps now and we weren't talking about it 10 years ago? Well, I was always taught you fix whatever hurts most first. And 10 years ago, I thought, man, was this really what hurt most? Like, no, we were waterfall 10 years ago. And what really hurt the most then was the development of the product. How many of you guys have ever been on a project that was late or missed its deadline? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you've ever written software, your hand should have been up, right? How many of you have ever been on a project that was over budget? Everyone raise your hands again. Because if you spent more time, you spent more money, right? And if you're a waterfall, how many of you delivered the product and it looked nothing like the people wanted it to do? Everyone raise your hand. Because right? if you were a waterfall, they said, I want a dessert. And you went into the kitchen and you started baking a pie, but what they had in their mind was a cake. You delivered a dessert, but it wasn't the dessert that they wanted. And had they been able to look at that dessert, like the, even the shape of the pie pan that I was going to use, like, hold on, why do you have a pie pan when I want a cake? And that's what Agile allows you to do. Show them progress every single time. I went to the store and I bought the ingredients. Well, I don't see frosting. What are you making? I'm making a pie. No, that's not what I want. And that Agile allows me to stop before I bake anything, go back to the store, get the right ingredients, and start baking a cake for this person, right? And we weren't doing that back where I was. I also remember that uh, we had to fix that first. So what do we do? Agile, Kanban, Scrum, test-driven development, extreme programming. All these things allow your teams now to produce value very, very quickly. But it's very important that I say the word produce and not deliver. Because producing value and delivering value are two drastically different things. I remember when I used to finish my software at Compaq and I would go to the production server, the production server, and I would log in with my own credentials and I would copy files all over the place, change the registry, I was the man, and then all of a sudden all the lights would go out. 
right? And the ops guy is like, Donovan, what the hell did you do? He's like, I just installed my software. And he's getting emails now because not only did I kill the server with my software, it killed servers with other people's software on it too. So they're upset as well. Like, That's it, Donovan. You don't get to touch the machine anymore. Well, what am I supposed to do? You have to package up your binaries, and then you have to write a document. And you're going to give me the document and the binaries, and I'm going to install it for you. Right? How many of you guys have written an install doc for your IT pro? Right? And every time you write the document, you write it with this happy path, everything's going to go great. It never goes that way. Right? And the poor guy is reading through the document, does exactly what you say, tries to run your software, all the lights go out, and there's no appendix that says, how do you get the server running again? So they are pointing the fingers at you saying you don't know how to write. I'm pointing the fingers at them saying you don't know how to read. It was all in the document. What in the hell happened? And this distrust began to build between IT pros and developers. They didn't trust us. I didn't trust them. Now there's red tape. There's approvals. There's all this red tape that happens that says before you can deploy anything, it takes weeks of nonsense before we're actually going to let you deploy it somewhere. And that is what hurts most now. We already know how to produce value. We still don't know how to deliver value. So if you've ever seen me present before, I'll go up and say, I'm just going to rub a little DevOps on this, and I'm going to make it better. Because to me, DevOps is like this ointment, this cure that's going to fix that chasm that has been developed between IT pros and developers over decades of distrust. So what does that take? It takes people, the IT pros, the devs, the business, everyone involved, to actually come together and agree that this is what we need to do. The process, that's the easy part. literally is. There's books on how to do this. Right? And there's nothing I'm going to show you today that you don't already know. Donovan's going to write unit tests. We know about unit tests. Donovan's going to write a CI build. Yep. Continuous deployment. Yep. But if I were to ask you, are you doing this, your head would go, nope. <laughs> we're not doing any of that stuff. Why? Probably because of the people that you have in your organization. Some of you believe. Some of you don't. And those that don't are creating roadblocks for those who do believe. The process is easy. So what I try to do as a program manager at Microsoft is produce the best products in the world. My hypothesis is, if my products are cool enough, easy enough to use, and it's just so obvious that this is going to make my life easier, that the people are going to want to use them, want to use them, because it's going to give them their weekends back. It's going to give them their nights back. It's going to give them time with their family back, because we're going to automate all the stuff that you would normally have to do yourself. So it won't be easy to convince the people, because the products are freaking that good. That's my job. If you don't believe me, remember my Twitter handle. If you don't think these products are that good, let me know, because I can do this stuff for any language, targeting any platform. So it's people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value. <clears throat> value being the most important word. I did not say software. I said value. An IT pro can deliver value without a developer changing a single line of the application. If you have an e-commerce site that only sustains a thousand simultaneous users, and you're getting close to Christmas, I don't care what code changes you make, chances are you're not going to get past 1,000 because you don't have the infrastructure in place to sustain that many simultaneous users. So an IT pro can go in there, go into Azure, AWS, Bluemix, wherever your resources live, and configure them, scale them up, scale them out, and all of a sudden you're doing 10,000 simultaneous users. That is value that you <coughs> delivered without changing a single line of your application. So value is what we want to be able to do. And you have to be able to measure the value. You can't just make a change and assume that you made added value and pat yourself on the back because you copied some files to a server. Are those files actually adding value or not? You have to monitor it. New Relic, Application Insights, Dynatrace, those are types of products that you can use that will monitor your application as it's being run in production. And let me know that those files that I copied out there, those new pages that I added to my website, 75% of the people who visit our website actually use those pages. You delivered value. If no one accesses those pages, or everyone that does gets an exception or an error, did you deliver value? No. You just randomly copied files to a server. And that to me is not DevOps. It's about delivering value continuously. So again, if you want an even longer explanation of this sentence, there's a blog post on why it took me 30 days to write it. And I can use this if it's mobile, Docker, backend, frontend, fat client, thin client, it's all the same. If you're writing software, it is to continuously deliver value to your end users. Are we clear on what DevOps is now? Yes, sir. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so now, why is it important? Because your competition is already doing this. That is why it's important. Right? I am obsessed with BMW, and there's an analogy that I use for motorcycles. I ride a BMW K1200S. 
It is way, way too fast, right? But I love this thing. And whenever I drive it, I'm a blue burr on the freeway. Just way too fast. But I wonder what people think four and five miles ahead of me when I'm just this blue speck in the rearview mirror. And they have no idea I'm doing triple digits. And all of a sudden, I pass them. And they realize, oh my God, I will never be able to catch that guy. That is your competition if you're still doing waterfall. Your competition is actually moving so fast that if you don't pay attention, if you don't get wise to what they're doing, by the time they pass you, it's too late. Ask the taxi industry about a little company called Uber. <laughs> Am I lying? That's one of the perfect examples. Taxi company was a monopoly for as long as I've been alive. They didn't have to change a single thing. Why? Because it was working. We're number one. Jeffrey Snover says that the biggest deterrent to uh, adopting DevOps is success. If I've been successful doing it this way for 30 years and I'm number one, why in the world would I change? Because your competition has already changed. And you're only number one now. When they start to hit their motion, when they start to hit their stride, and they're doing triple digits and you're still putting along on the slow lane, and you get passed by Uber, the taxi company is still trying to recover from that. Look what Amazon did to big retail, right? Brick and mortar shops are all trying to go online now because they're getting their butts kicked by Amazon. Because Amazon's people started doing it differently. They were thinking about it differently. How many of people know about Jet.com? Have you, any of you even heard about Jet.com? Very few of you. You know why? Because they were bought by Walmart. Why? Because from zero to 12 months, they became such a threat that they literally had to buy them to stop from being beat by a company that was only 12 months old. That is your competition. And you have to make sure that you are the one switching already. Because if you're not, you're going to be the next one. Because not, hey, I can't afford to buy all my competition. Can you? Right? So it's cheaper to beat them than it is to buy them. And we're not, we all don't have a luxury of whenever someone threatens us just to go buy them and shut them up. Right? So your competition is already doing this. Now what's really cool about DevOps is it allows you to increase your velocity and reduce your downtime, which normally is an oxymoron. To do one usually increases the other. Because to move fast usually means to incur more risk. To incur more risk usually means that you probably have a little bit more trouble in your application, but luckily we can respond very quickly to that. But if you do DevOps correctly, you can increase your velocity and reduce your downtime. How do you do that? By reducing the human error. Any ASP.NET developers in the room? I love ASP.NET. Love it, right? How many of you have ever been burned by a web.config? Everyone raise your hands again. Right? Because you went into that file in a hurry on a production server, you left off an angle bracket, and you got the yellow screen of death. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is you went into the file in production, and you put in the wrong connection string, and now you're pointing at a dev database. Right? Because you sent a human being to do a machine's job. Never, ever, ever send a human being to do a machine's job. Let the machines do it perfectly every single time. You want to automate as much as you can. Reduce the human errors. Zeros and ones should not be touched by human beings. Just that simple. And I'm going to show you the tools today that we can actually automatically deploy to any platform that you want. But we can still have the human beings participate in the deployment, right? What we want them to be able to do is say, everything looks good, keep on going. But they will never touch the actual files that are going to be deployed. There's a difference there. If I'm a QA lead, I don't want every CI build to go into my QA environment. Because I'm in the middle of testing the last release. It might take me a couple days to do so, and I can't have my test results being overwritten by every CI build that comes out every five minutes. So as your QA lead, I want to be able to control when the tool goes into my environment. So I can make you an approver that says, if and only if Donovan says it's okay, can you actually deploy the version that you want to in that environment. So human beings can participate in the deployment, but they will not touch any of the files that get deployed. Right? That's a very, very key point there. This is by far the most important slide I'm going to show you today. Whenever I say the word Visual Studio, every Java developer I know's eyes roll back so hard I can hear them. Right? Because that's not for us. Right? Visual Studio equals .NET. Visual Studio equals Windows developer. But that's not the case. Visual Studio equals developer. Period. I don't care if you're Java, .NET, I don't care if you're Node.js or if you're PHP, Python, Ruby, I don't care. Whatever language you want to program in, we can help you version it, track it, build it, and deploy it. On any platform that you want, mobile, Docker, Linux, Mac, we don't care. This is a new Microsoft. 
Satya Nadella has come in and literally changed the face of Microsoft in what, three years now? Right? It's amazing. We're the number one contributor to open source in the world. Microsoft. And those who remember Compaq know how weird that is to hear. Right? This is a company who thought it was cancer, right? And open source was supposed to be killed and Apple with it. But now all of a sudden we integrate with all that stuff. And I actually have a Mac in my hotel room. And a Mac Mini at my desk at, at my house. How do I join Microsoft and I have two Macs now? Right? That makes no sense to me. The first time I installed Linux, after I joined Microsoft. We're also a platinum sponsor at the Linux Foundation. Right? This is not your daddy's Microsoft. When it comes to dev tools, we can help you wherever you are. On your Macs, inside of Eclipse, inside of IntelliJ. If you want to use Android Studio, if you want to write an Xcode, if you want to do uh, wherever you want to program, we're just going to keep putting Visual Studio in your face till you believe it. That we're here for everybody. And I'm going to show you some of that here today. We own the mobile DevOps space. We own it. Why? Because we bought everything. We bought Hockey App, we bought Xamarin, and we already had Visual Studio Team Services. Slam all that together, you have a complete DevOps pipeline for mobile for any platform you want. Right? And we're the only company on earth that actually has that. So this slide here, I'm going to go quick because I want to get to the demo. But this slide here is basically reduce the number of vendors in your DevOps pipeline. That's the moral of this slide deck. Three years ago, when you wanted to build a DevOps pipeline, you had to use all different types of vendors because no one vendor had everything. Right? We tried with 2005, 2008. It only worked really well with .NET, which is why we have the reputation that we have today. Right? That Visual Studio equals .NET. Because if you wanted to do .NET, it was great. If you wanted to do anything else, it was hard. Not impossible, but hard. Um, now it's easy to do any language, and we want to make sure that we prove that. But that every time you add another vendor to your DevOps pipeline, you are paying a tax. The tax of integration that you pay over and over and over again. It's not how much you paid for the tool. It's how much you continuously pay in your developer's time and effort to maintain that tool chain when vendor A's tool has to talk to vendor B's tool. And if any one of them upgrades or revs, you now have to go back in and make sure they continue to talk to each other. Microsoft allows you to use one manufacturer, one vendor for your entire tool chain. We own the language in many cases if you're using C Sharp. We own the IDE that you're actually going to be running on. Visual Studio works both on Windows and now on Mac as well. Or you can use Visual Studio Code on your Linux machine as well. We own the source control, your bugs, your builds, your release, your monitoring. Everything is all handled by one vendor now. But do not think that I'm saying vendor lock-in, which is a bad word. And that's a lot of you guys are thinking right now. Of course, but we're not putting all our eggs in the Microsoft basket. Because what if there's something cool that's already out there? Or we already have an investment in Jenkins that we need to be able to leverage. What are we supposed to do then? My answer, which is going to be mind-blowing to you guys, is keep using those tools. And let us integrate them with the tools that we have here at Microsoft. You might never get down to one vendor for your pipeline, although you can. But you need to get down to as few vendors as you possibly can in that pipeline so that you don't continuously pay that tax of integration. If you want to do tracking, TFS, Visual Studio Team Services. We have infrastructures code inside of Azure through ARM templates. It's just a JSON file. Desire State Configuration works both on Mac and on, I'm sorry, it works on both Windows and on Linux. Now, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people didn't know that DSC was on Linux long before we open source PowerShell. Right? So if you want to do configuration as code, you can do it on both major server platforms, Linux or on Windows. If you want to deploy your applications, we will deploy any binary that you give us. Configuration, tokenization stops you from touching those web.configs. configs. Right? It actually stops you from touching any text file that needs to be configured differently for each environment. It does not have to be a web.config. I use that as an example, but it's any text file that you want. If you're using SQL Server and you do not know what the initials SSDT stands for, you need to look it up as soon as you leave. SQL Server Data Tools is one of Microsoft's best kept secrets. It allows you to version your database like every other part of your application. You get to check it into source control, you get to build it as part of your CI, you get to deploy it as part of your CD. Your entire database schema is managed for you just like your web app, just like everything else that you develop. SSDT also allows you to do a lot of cool stuff for unit testing your databases and actually packaging up the data that you need for your automated test. So that when I deploy my database, I'm also deploying a known set of data that I can then use for all my automated automation tests. It's coded UI, web tests, performance tests, Selenium if you prefer. We can run all those for you as part of our release. And then we'll pause the system, allow you to go in there and do exploratory testing, functional testing, and manual testing. I think we're decades away from not needing manual testers. Right? Manual testing is an integral part of deploying any application that has a user interface. Don't believe me? I'll tell you a quick story. 
So there was this company who had amazing automation. Great battery of unit test, an amazing battery of automated UI test, and the developer went in and made a very insignificant CSS change. Pushed the code out, all the builds were green, all the releases were green, but they instantly started losing money. Like, this is weird. So one developer goes and he's staring at the build output. I don't understand all the unit tests pass. Another developer runs and goes and looks at the release pipeline. I don't understand all the freaking automation pass. And they're just staring at them. And then one of them gets the idea. Why don't we go look at the website? Right? And see why we're losing money on the website. So the guy goes out and it's an e-commerce site. Starts putting stuff in this basket. Goes through and puts in his address and his credit card. And then he sees it. The last button on the last one after you put in your credit card the button's blank because the CSS change made the text and the button the exact same color. No human being in their right mind puts in their credit card and then clicks a blank button. But automation happily will. Why? Because the ID of that button did not change. At that point in the automation, I am supposed to click a button with ID OK and it happily did it even though they had absolutely no text on that button. So that's a reason why manual testing still needs to exist. And what we do is pause our system for you using release management that will allow you to say, if and only if you say everything is okay, are we going to continue to deploy this out into the next environment for you. So do whatever validation that needs to be, manual or otherwise, and once you say it's okay, we'll continue the automation for you. And to deliver value, you have to monitor it. Did we actually deliver value? Application Insights is a great tool to allow you to determine, are we actually delivering value or are we just randomly copying files to a server? Okay? If you can, and what I said earlier, if you wanted this to be Dynatrace or you wanted this to be New Relic, that's fine. If you wanted this to be Octopus Deploy, that's fine. If you want to replace this with Chef or Puppet, if you wanted to replace any of these things with any other tool you wanted to, our system will continue to work, but you are now incurring the interest of having multiple vendors in your pipeline. All right, so just remember, reduce it as much as you can. You might never get to one, but the fewer you have, the better. Team Foundation Server and Visual Studio Team Services are two sides of the exact same coin. I like to say they're like, they're like twins, where one of them was born sooner than the other. Right? This one is updated every three weeks. It is always a minimum of three months more present than this one. Team Foundation Server, you install on-prem yourself. <coughs> And you get to maintain it, which means if you're not ready for the cloud and you're uncomfortable putting your intellectual property in the cloud, we have the exact same offering for you on-prem as well. If you're comfortable with the cloud and you're ready to go, and that's where we are, Office is code, Windows code, Visual Studio Team Services, Visual Studio IDE, Visual Studio Code are all sitting on the right-hand side in the cloud right now. And we trust it with our IP, so trust me, you can trust it with yours as well. What are they? They are everything that you need to turn an idea into a working piece of software. Everything. Source control, Git or centralized, bug tracking, agile planning, test case management, continuous deployment, build automation, release management, the whole nine yards all packaged for you as one vendor, but all replaceable if you need to. Now let me show you the stuff in action here in just a second. This is a boring slide. Um, it's Microsoft all up. This is the Microsoft that you know and love and some of you know and hate. It's Microsoft from the left to the right. This is the more cool slide. Because a lot of you probably recognize names on this you're probably using a lot of these tools in your organization right now, and you probably weren't willing to replace any of these even if you were to start to use some of what we do at Microsoft. Fun part is, you don't have to replace any of it. We integrate with all of this. These are names that you would not notoriously think, hey, Microsoft would have nothing to do with these companies. Well, in actuality, we have something to do with all of these companies. They integrate very well with all the tools that we offer here at Microsoft. So you don't have to throw away the investment that you currently have and tooling you might have in your DevOps pipeline to start to add additional value to it. That's the point. Enough talk. Let's go have some fun now. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go and do a full end-to-end -end demo. I have about 34 minutes left, so that's good. And if time permits, I'm going to show you uh, something else. I'll just call it something else. I, won't, I don't want to spoil it for you. So what we're going to do here is switch over to Team Services. So <clears throat> this is Team Services. Um, this is just a heads up dashboard. At this point of this demo, because I'm going to produce something out of thin air, I feel like a magician that I need to prove to you that I don't have anything yet, right? So there's no rabbit in the hat. You know how he takes the wand and he beats it around into the hat. This is what I'm doing right now. As you can see, there's no projects over here where it says recent projects. There are no projects. And then I'm going to go over here to, this is inside of my Azure portal. And I'm going to create a um, resource group called end-to-end -end demo. 
as part of this demo, and as you can see inside of Azure, there are no resources in a resource group called end-to-end -end demo. In a couple minutes, there will be, and I'm just going to show you how all that stuff actually happens. <coughs> So let's get started over here in Visual Studio. I have no source code, no nothing. I need to create what we call a team project. A team project is a grouping that allows me to define where I'm going to put my builds, my source code, my automated deployments, my test cases, my work items, my product backlogs, my Kanban boards, all that kind of stuff, right? So we're obviously going to call one called end-to-end -end demo. And we allow you to actually use more than one process template. A process template is where the tool will use vocabulary that's familiar to you based on how you run your teams. So if you use Agile, we'll use words like user story and issue and iteration. But if you choose Scrum, we're going to say product backlog and sprint and impediment. And if you choose CMMI, which is essentially waterfall, we'll say requirement and change request and risk and all the other things that you're used to doing in a waterfall environment. So our tool is smart enough to be able to say, hey, we know how you run your team, and we're going to make sure our tool uses the same vocabulary that your team does. And you get to choose from source control. We're one of the only vendors that I'm aware of that actually allows you two different types of version control. If you like centralized version control, check in, check out, get latest, like those are like the three main commands you need to know how to use, then we offer that through Team Foundation Server Version Control. If you're one of those crazy people who like Git instead, then we give you Git as well, right? I cannot stand Git, right? I think it's the worst thing ever invented because I have to go to the command line and get corporal tunnel syndrome trying to type in rebase and fetch and sync and all the other nonsense that I have to do when I just want to change a freaking file, right? So I can't stand it. But there are people out there that like it. And I'm glad that we put it inside of team services so that they don't use that as an excuse not to use us. One thing that's really cool about our Git is it's absolutely free. Unlimited private repos for absolutely free. So if you're paying a dime for your Git repos, I can give you that money back, or you can go take that money back as soon as you leave this room. Go open up a Visual Studio Team Services account, add a remote to all your Git repos to Team Services, push them, and stop paying for your Git repos. It is the exact same Git you know and love from GitHub and Bitbucket and all those other guys, but it's absolutely for free. Okay, It's the only difference. So I'll use Git just to prove that I'm a cool kid like everyone else. <laughs> and right now what it's doing is it's going off and saying, okay, Donovan, I know that you want to run an Agile team. I know you want to get repo. And what I'm going to do now is build out all the plumbing that you need so that you can actually get to work immediately. And it actually is going to make sure that I even have resources in the cloud for building. So I don't have to install a build server. I don't have to install a build agent. There's one in the cloud waiting for us. So as soon as I have code, it'll go off and start trying to build that code for me in the cloud automatically. I can also stand up my own, and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. So just that quickly, I have now created this logical container where all my code is actually going to be able to live. This is a dashboard, which I'll customize later on. But now it's basically trying to guide you to success, is what we call this, right? So what we want to do is take someone who's never touched the tool and guide them, like hold their hand through the process of getting started and being successful. So it says, where would you like to start? Would you like to start with code, or would you like to start with work? And we're going to start inside of Git. So I'm going to say, I would like to start with code. And say, OK, great. If you don't know how to use Git, this is how you use Git. You can use this URL here, you can go to the command line, and you can start typing your little life away. Or, if you're using Visual Studio, you can click this button here, and we'll just go give you the code inside Visual Studio, and I'm going to do that later. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize my repo with a readme file. So readme.md, that stands for markdown. Uh, I should stand for bad decision, because markdown is stupid, and we, no one should use it. Right? HTML was good enough for me. I don't know why we had to change it to the more even cryptic type of thing. Have you ever tried to edit Markdown? You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You just get blinded with these hashtags and all this nonsense. But if you want to watch it, view it, you can view it here. And you can also do cool stuff like edit it. So if I want to come over here, I can actually come in here. And if I can remember this correctly, I'm going to go ahead and rub a little DevOps on this like I like to do. And as you can see, it's actually not a half bad editor right here in the, in the cloud for you. So what's really cool about this is if you need to make a quick change to a repo, you don't have to go and remember all the Git clone and all that stuff. You can literally make the change directly in the browser, commit it, and go ahead and start your CI system. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and save this. And like I said before, it wants to guide you to success. All right, Donovan, you have a primed repo, but you don't have a build set up yet. Why don't we go ahead and set up a build? What it's saying here is that you don't need to have code to know how to build the code you intend to produce. If you know you're going to be producing an ASP.NET web application, you can actually have the build in place, and as soon as you start committing code, it starts building. And that's what we're going to do now. So what I really want to point out on this dialog box is, if you're already doing mobile development, 
and you're not using Xamarin or Cordova, and you started with Xcode, we have you covered and we can build it for you directly on your Mac. If you are using Xamarin, you can actually use Xamarin to go Android, iOS, or Windows Phone. That's all here for you as well. Clearly, we're going to cover you when it comes to uh, Visual Studio. But what I like is up here, if you're a Java team, you're probably using Ant or Gradle or Maven. And those are out of the box, ready to go rock and roll for you. You don't have to install anything. There's no plugins to download. There's nothing to configure. We're ready to build your Java. We're ready to build your mobile. And we're ready to build your Windows right out of the box. Right? Because if you've ever installed Jenkins, Remember back when you installed Jenkins, right? It's been so long ago, you probably don't remember how painful it was to download all the plugins and configure them correctly before you could build anything successfully with it. I do it constantly to see if they've gotten better to make sure our experience is better. So as long as it took me to create that team project was as long as it took me to configure my build server so that it is ready to build everything that I just mentioned, right? So again, true cost of ownership is how easy it is for us to set up. But what I want to do is this one. I'm just going to do it ASP.NET. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. And then from here, as you can see, I can get code from GitHub if I need to. So remember earlier I said you don't have to stop using what you're using today. So if you're already in GitHub and you like paying for repos, then knock yourself out. <laughs> right? You can leave them there and you can go ahead and pull directly from GitHub. Right? As soon as you make a commit to GitHub, we'll pull it down and start building it for you. If you're in Bitbucket or GitLab or Git Enterprise, that's this one. And if you're already in Subversion, you can stay there. Right? We're not asking you or forcing you to move out of where you are to start using our system, but clearly I'm going to use our own. Uh, I'm going to be building out a master, and by checking this box, I now have continuous integration. It's going to monitor that repo for every commit. Whenever there's a commit, it's going to automatically start this build for me, no, no questions asked. Now, this is the hosted agent pool that was created for you in the cloud. It is sitting there. It is waiting to do your builds for you, but what's really cool is you can actually create additional ones. One of those, the one called Linux, is running on Ubuntu 16.04 machines. The one running on Red Hat is clearly running on HL, what is it, RHL. So I have a Red Hat Linux box that has a build agent on it. In Houston, Texas, right now, there's a Mac Mini on my desk just waiting for me to ask you to go build an iOS application for me. And if those who know, who knows who Scott Goo is? Scott Guthrie from Microsoft? Right. He's one of our fearless leaders. He's an awesome guy. And I am very privileged to, I get to demo with him a lot. And I have a series of machines just for him that are really, really big, really, really fast, and just waiting to do demos for Scott. And that's really cool is that I can make sure that those don't get used by accident by anyone else by putting them in their own group. And then I'll obviously have my own pool here, which is what I'm going to use, which is my default pool. I have some pretty decent machines in Azure too. So we're going to use those. And now I'm actually done. The entire build is going to show up here completely configured and ready to rock and roll. There's nothing else that I have to touch. You can, but you don't have to. It knows about NuGet, so it's going to restore my NuGet packages for me. It understands that not only do I need to build this with Visual Studio, but I need to pass in these MS build arguments so that it gets packaged as a web, do web deploy so that I can actually deploy it in Azure. <coughs> and if you've ever had to Google or Bing to find these things, you know how painful it is to have to remember it. So we're basically trying to make that easier for you so that it's just set up for you automatically. I'm a huge fan of unit tests and even a bigger fan of code coverage if you use code coverage correctly. It's not about the number, it's about the movement, but we can talk about that later. Uh, just checking that box now enables code coverage for all the tests that I'm going to be running as part of my build. And if I want to now, I'm going to go back over here and simply save it. We'll come back later and talk about some more of this other stuff. So I'm just going to call this CI for my CI build, and I'm going to click on OK. So, so far, we have a repo, we have a build already set up, and now I need some work to do. So without even leaving the web browser, I'm simply going to click on Work. And from here, I'm going to go ahead and say, take me into my work pane. Now, this is a Kanban board, which I'll bring you back to, but first I want to show you our backlog. For those who are not Agilists, a backlog is just a laundry list of any and everything that you want your software to do in priority order, plain and simple, right? Start from the top, let's work our way down to the bottom. That's the most important thing at the top. I love having this up during our sprint review. Again, for the non agilist a sprint review is the meeting that you have at the end of every sprint where you show the progress to your stakeholders and your product owner of this is what we produced in the previous sprint. Please give us your feedback and comments so that we can make sure that we're going the right way. This is where they say, Donovan, why did you buy a pie pan when I ordered a cake? This is where this would happen. And what I love having is this screen up in the back of the room as the scrum master. And whenever I hear good feedback from the audience, I simply come over here and say, that's a good idea. We should do an end-to-end -end demo. And just that quickly, I'm able to add new items to our product backlog. After the meeting, I go and I sit with our product owner, and we drag and drop these things around until they're in the right order so that my team can go back in and start working on the most important thing. To start working on the most important thing, they need to start adding new tasks. So they simply click on this button here, say I want to add a new task, 
And just this easily, I can go back in here and say, I would like to go ahead and create a release as part of my building this particular item. And I can now start to see all of the tasks required to turn this user story or this product backlog item into a working piece of software. Now you can see this either collapsed or you can see it expanded. I notice I usually do prioritization this way so that my person just quickly drags and drops them. And then when they think they're done, I'm like, are you sure that this is the most important thing? They're like, yes, absolutely, this is the most important thing. And then I go like this, and they see there's like 40 tasks under there, and then they freak out and like, okay, that's not that important, right? And then they move everything around again, right? So it's really cool to have the visualization to make it very clear what are the consequences of your decisions when you decide what's more, and more or less important. But this isn't the only visualization. You can also look at it on a Kanban board. A Kanban board allows you to visualize the movement of your code from inception to completion. This is one of the best Kanban boards I've ever seen, and it's a result of a lot of basically comparing ourselves to our competitors, getting our butts kicked in what we call bake-offs, and then going back in and innovating on this. Um, I recorded a show called Visual Studio Toolbox. It's on Channel 9. If you guys aren't familiar, you go to channel9.msdn.com, and you can see all these cool shows. One of them is called Visual Studio Toolbox. I asked the product manager that owns this board to come on the show and give us a really cool tour of it. So you're interested in Kanban and what you can do with this board, go back and find that episode on Channel 9 and you'll, she'll do a much better job of explaining it to you than I will ever will. What I like about this is how usable it is. I can continue to add tasks here without having to go and open up the big form if I want to. After I add the task, I can even reprioritize them. And what I really like about this is it actually enables Signal R. Signal R is a technology that allows anyone now who is watching this board on their machine or in their team room inside of uh, Microsoft Teams, when I go over and I drag and drop this guy over to here, it moves on their screen as well, right? So it's really real time. If I'm in a daily stand-up and all my people are somewhere else, then we can actually collaborate and see all in real time everyone moving their tiles around, right? So it's really cool to have Signal R there. As you can see, it automatically assigned it to me, and now it's time for us to do what everyone does inside of Git. What's the number one rule of Git? Branch everything, right? So what we want to do is make sure that if you want to go work on this code, you create a branch for it, and then you go off and you work in that branch, and then eventually you do something called a pull request, which is, hey guys, please bless my code, give it a thumbs up, and when it's done, shove it into master, and let's start going down the pipeline. So what we want you to be able to do is quickly create the branch directly from here because this is what you're going to go work on. You shouldn't have to leave here to go create a branch and remember where you were. Again, we're guiding you through doing the right thing. So I'm going to go ahead and call this a knit, and I can actually associate with this branch what it is I intend to achieve. So now the branch is identified as Donovan is going off to work on creating a project for us for this end-to-end -end demo that he's going to be producing. Right? So it actually is giving you this traceability, which is really hard to get when you're using multiple vendors in your DevOps pipeline. Because it all comes from Microsoft, and it all mandatory has to talk to each other, I get all this stuff for free. It just starts to light up and starts to work for me. So let's go ahead and create that branch. So with the branch created, this is when the hell of Git begins. Because now I have to clone and check out the right branch and do all that kind of stuff, right? But I joke about Git, and I am not the biggest fan, but I do understand its power. I understand why people like it. But what I think no one can argue is that the learning curve of Git is brutal. I still, to this day, have no idea when I'm supposed to rebase or not. Right? <laughs> I'm just told it was a bad thing, so I try not to do it. If I ever get stuck, I just delete my whole folder and clone it over again, and hopefully I can redo my code. But what I don't want you to have to do is pay that cost of the learning curve. So what we're doing at Microsoft is saying, how can we allow you to leverage the power of Git yet never have to go through that painful learning curve. Or, if you don't want to, ever go to a command line, which is what the majority of the Git hardcores that I know do. They go to the command line and they go to, no, go to town. So what I'm going to do is show you how I can use all the power of Git, yet never see a command line. Now don't think that you can't go to the command line. For all you Git users out there that are already superstars and know how to do it from the command line, all your Git tools still work, all your command lines are exactly the same. So you don't have to get away from those, but I clearly don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, I want you to reach from the web down onto my machine and fire up Visual Studio for me. And I want you to fire it up such that you are ready to clone the repo that I just clicked on. So I don't have to remember the URL. I don't have to set up any crazy SSH stuff. All I want you to do is make this work for me. So I click on clone. And what it's going to do now from the Team Explorer window is clone that repo down onto my hard drive for me. But once it's done, it's going to go over and switch me over and say, hey, Donovan, we're in Solution Explorer. You're ready to rock and roll. But remember, I created a branch specifically for this code. This was a really hard thing for me to learn.
from the command line. I kept looking for the code. I didn't figure it out. And the branch never showed up when I did git branch, but then you have to do git branch remote, and then you have to do a checkout, and then finally you can see all that stuff. But what we do here is to say, hey, look, go to branches, go and look at your remotes, and if that's the one you want, just double click it. All right? So I've just gone through what took me actually emailing a guy at my work. I had to get Chris Patterson to tell me, dude, where's this branch I'm supposed to be working on? Because I honestly could not figure it out. And now it literally is always in front of you. So now everything that I do is going to be in the init branch, ready to rock and roll for me. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to home and we're going to create a project very quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and click on new. I want to do ASP.NET because I am a Windows guy and I do love ASP.NET. So we're going to call this end-to-end -end demo. I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. And now I'm going to do MVC. I don't care about authentication for my demo. Um, we're definitely going to go to Azure in this demo. And like I said before, I love unit tests. So we're going to go ahead and write some unit tests. Now it's saying, hey, you said that you want to go to Azure, so I'm going to help you set that part of it up as well. So obviously this web app is going to be my debug version, so this is going to be in the end demo D. This is my subscription. I would like to create a new resource group, and we're going to call that resource group in the end demo, uh, like I agreed to earlier. And then what I'm going to do here is decide what size machines do I want to use for my web apps. And I'm fine using really small machines, so we're going to go ahead and do shared here. And this should be loading up. I'm not sure why my internet's going a little slow here. Cancel this and try that again. Do, do, do. I don't know why they're not loading. So let's see. I don't know if it's going to let me save this or not. Yeah, I know. I need a research group. All right, we'll stick with this one. But I'm not sure why my network is not working. Cancel that. I think we're going to be all right. All right, so what it's doing now, if you've ever done a file new project before inside of Visual Studio, what it does is it goes off and says, hey, I need to create the files for you. And after I create the files for you inside of Visual Studio, I'm actually going to go out and talk to um, Azure for you as well. But maybe I'm having some network connectivity issues here. Let me see if I lost my network. Because all that's a little bit slow. Yeah, I think I lost the oh, no, maybe not. But we're definitely having some network connectivity issues here. So let's see if this is finally going to snap out of it. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do here is hit and demo D. And resource group, go hit to end demo. And let's try this one more time. Oh, Oops. it's a release candidate. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that happened there. This is a release candidate, so we're going to try this one more time. <coughs> I blame all things on release candidate at that point. So I'm not sure what my network was happening there. Right now what it should be doing is on my hard drive, it is now creating an entire application inside of Visual Studio like it always does with File New Project. What it should also be doing is communicating with Azure right now saying, hey Azure, I need you to create a web app that will be the home of this website once Donovan's through developing it and he finally checks it in to version control. So let's go verify since we had some trouble that that actually happened or not. So if I come over here and I refresh this, great, we have our repo that was not there before. If I come in here. I have no resources, which is not a good thing, and hopefully we're going to get some resources here in just a moment. So hopefully those are going to show up here. I think it's still creating it in the background. So let's go and see if we can go ahead and build this thing and make sure that this project is working as expected. Uh, so now it's basically saying, hey, do you want to make sure and connect it to Application Insights? Of course I do, because that's how I can determine if I actually deploy value or not. So let's go ahead and get started for free. Um, I definitely want to create this thing inside end to end demo. Let's go ahead and configure this. The resource group, end to end demo. This is going to be for D, which basically means I want a bucket for application insights for my development, another one for QA, and another one for prod, so all the telemetry isn't all munged together in the exact same place. I'm going to go ahead and say OK, and then go ahead and register this for free. So now this is just giving me an example of some of the stuff that you can actually get from Application Insights, custom telemetry, analytics. It'll show up in your code lens for you inside of um, Visual Studio Code and inside of Visual Studio. Uh, it also tell you, like for example, how many response requests per second you're getting, what your response time is, all that cool stuff. Automatically for free. You don't have to do anything to get that. If you want to start adding custom telemetry, that you, you can. So let's go back over to Azure and see if it finally started to play nice or not. Perfect. Okay. So here is my web app. Uh, let's go ahead and create a couple more. Uh, so this is for dev. I also want to create one for QA and one for production as well. So let's just go for web app. And let's create a couple more really, really quick. So what we're going to do is just click on this 
and show you that we can do it from inside of Visual Studio. But if you want to do it from here, you can as well. So we're going to go ahead and do one for QA. And yeah, I'll go ahead and do Application Insights for that. Create. And then we're going to do one more for production. Because I want to have a full pipeline, dev, QA, and prod. I don't want to just have dev and, and stop there. So I want to show you how we can do all three. So we're building a full pipeline with Application Insights and everything else. All right, great. So while that's off and running, let's go back over here. This is finished, which is good. Now what I have to do is basically commit this to my version control. And that doesn't look right either. Ooh -wee. This demo is going off the rails. Because <laughs> that should be a lot more files there. <clears throat> so, I think I'm going to call an audible here. And I'm going to show you something much cooler than all of what I was about to show you anyway. Well, I'm going to show you some magic here because we're running out of time. So we're going to type yo vsts. And I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to try to build this entire pipeline for us from a command line. So yo vsts is an open source tool that I created to allow you to build that entire pipeline that I'm showing you or wanted to show you guys without ever having to go into the tools and go through the experience that I just went through. Talk about my other thing, which is where I said I could do it for any language, right? So all I have to do is say, I want to do ASP.NET. And from here, I'm going to say, yep, I want to do ASP.NET. <laughs> yeah, what do I want to call my um, application? Do I want to deploy to Docker or do I want to deploy to App Service? Um, what Team Services account do I want to use? I get to say what pool. Remember, I chose default when I created my CI build. I'm choosing default again. And then you say, basically, have permission to access my Team Services account. And now what I do is say what subscription I want. And it's saying, do you want to do development locally or not? Not really. I just want this thing to finally work so I can push some code and show you what's happening. So what it's doing right now is when I first started and I went and I said, hey, let me create a new team project and I explained all the different, that's what it's doing right now. It's saying, hey, team services, I'm going to go create a project for you. And inside that project, fingers crossed, we're going to basically get a build, your source code, everything actually created for you. So it's saying, hey, I found the pool that you wanted to use. I was able to find the Azure subscription. I connected your Azure subscription to your actual uh, team services account so that they can actually communicate with each other. I'm trying to create your CI build for you inside of your, uh, so you have a build waiting for your source code. After that, it should try to create a, um, a release definition, which says, hey, this is the release definition that's going to actually deploy your code automatically into Azure for you. It does the clone for me so that I don't, again, don't have to know that much about uh, Git. Make sure that all my remotes are set up correctly. So now if I do a git push, this should magically just work. It's even doing the initial commit locally of the files that I just created. And it says all you have to do now is a git push. So if I go over to ASP.NET demo and I do a git push, like magic, this stuff should just push into Visual Studio Team Services. And what I'm going to do is show you everything that just got created for you. So that took about less than four minutes. Right? And what I just did in that four minutes was create a repo, a project, a build, a release, and everything that you need to go into Azure using infrastructure as code. So it actually creates the ARM templates for you and then configures those ARM templates to be deployed using release management. And now what I can do is show you the entire pipeline. So what I was trying to do manually is what I just did here automatically. And now if I go over to Team Services, and I'm basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to back out and go and show you this new product that was just created for us. Right? So come here and go to Account Settings. You'll see that this ASP.demo is the project that was just created from the command line. It wasn't there before we started. I can come in here now, and if we go and we look at our builds, we'll see that we actually have a new build, and that build is automatically running, because I did the commit to get push into my repo. So if I were to go over here and look at this build, uh, you'll see that it's actually downloading information. It'll show me in real time what's actually going on here. And then when it's done, I'll be able to go back and look at the summary. But let me show you what it built for you, because the build it built for us is actually a little bit more complicated than the build that I built by hand. So this is ASP.NET Core. ASP.NET Core uses a completely different build engine than the Visual Studio stuff. So basically it uses Bower for the front end, does a, get, uh, a .NET Restore, runs unit tests for me. Calculating code coverage on, on .NET Core is a little tricky right now. We already figured that stuff out for you so that you don't have to. And we actually calculate those for you as well. We publish those results for you. We then publish this <coughs> so that we can then package it and send it over into um, Azure for you. Uh, one, some of the cool things that we can do with our CI system, if you want to, you can actually have a bug created for every build that fails so that the developer who broke your CI build can't run away from it. They go inside of Eclipse, they go inside Visual Studio, wherever they go, this bug is haunting them. And basically saying, you broke the build, it's time for you to bring donuts and, until they close it. Uh, so I like checking this box here as well. 
Again, repositories, we can pull it from anywhere. Our variables can actually be encrypted, which is really nice. So if you have an IT pro who has a password for a particular item that no one else is allowed to see, they can come in, enter it, password protect it, and then no one will ever be able to see that particular value. We also have history here, so if you were to go and change your build definition, we track the changes for you so that you'll know exactly why your build broke and who was the person who made the change, and if you wanted to go back in and revert that change uh, as well. We have retention policies and some other general stuff as well. In addition to that, we also created a release. A release is like the, it's like a sibling of our build system. And what I mean by that is after you look at our release, our build system, if you look at our release system, they look very, very similar. The reason why is because we want you to immediately be familiar with this user interface after spending time with the other user interface. Now what you're going to notice is different is that we have this column over here called environment. And this allows you to define logical groups of where you want particular tasks to occur during your deployment. So for dev, what I want to do is take an ARM template, go out into Azure, and tell Azure, go spin up this particular infrastructure for me. After it's been spun up, I then deploy my application into it, and I rinse and repeat that for dev, QA, and for production. Another thing that it does for you automatically is you'll notice that this little one next to this person icon, it set up an approver for me. An approver is an individual or group or combination thereof of people who have to give us a thumbs up before they can enter and or exit this particular environment. So this is really powerful so that your QA lead can say, hey, don't touch my environment till I say so. And then after, so after that, still wait for you to give the thumbs up. Because if I do all my manual testing and I find a lot of bad bugs, I don't want this to continue. And I have the control of being able to say, nope, this does not pass our validation. Do not let this go into the next environment as well before we get to the next guy. So we have complete control there. Our task library is very, very good. Uh, it has tasks in here for Docker, for Chef, for Puppet, for Octopus Deploy. And a lot of these are out of the box. And some of these come from our marketplace. Our marketplace is where you can go and actually download the equivalent of some of the plugins that you would do for Jenkins, but these are a little bit more than just a plugin for your build or your release. They can have new widgets for your dashboard. They can have uh, new hubs inside of team services. The extensibility here is really, really good. What I like about this is our competition is in here as well. So they're like, hey, we're not letting Visual Studio team services go and create all this cool stuff and us not play in that environment. We want our customers to know that they want to keep using Chef, they want to keep using Octopus Deploy, the plugins already exist for them to continue to do that. Redgate is in here for database deployment and things like that. So names you already know and trust, they're already in here and waiting for you to be able to add that value to uh, your pipelines for you and to Visual Studio Team Services. They're extremely easy to create. If you wanted to write your own, you either need to know PowerShell or Node.js. If you know those two languages, you're already ready to start building these yourself. You can share them privately within your organization, or you can share them publicly like a lot of us do for everyone to go ahead and download and play with. Uh, so this task list is a um, big fan here. One other thing I'll say real quick is on this utility tab, our build system and our release system can do anything that you can do from a command line, period. If you can show me a command line that achieves the goal that you want, we can run that command line for you on Mac, Windows, and Linux whenever you want us to. So if you've already invested heavily in PowerShell or Bash scripts or Batch scripts to be able to go ahead and do your deployments, you don't have to throw them away. Just give them to us, we'll run them for you, we will always pass in the right parameters, and we will run them at the right time for you. This is for Batch scripts, this is for any arbitrary command line on any platform that you want. Down here we have PowerShell, and we also have the one over here for Linux and Mac. Right, so if you're already doing your Bash scripting, Batch scripting, PowerShell, go ahead and keep utilizing that stuff. You don't have to throw it away. So it's a very powerful uh, concept here as well. And now what should actually have happened here is if I go back over to my releases, I can see that this has already been successful and it's waiting for me to give it an approval. And as you can see, I can defer this approval too, which is really cool. So I can say, hey, look, it's Wednesday. I know I'll be done by Friday. So I'm going to approve it, but I'm going to put Friday night at midnight as the date. The system will go to sleep. And then at Friday night at midnight, wake back up, deploy your environment so that Monday when you come in, you have a fresh environment for you to start testing on, but you didn't have to remember on Monday to approve it and then wait for it to do the deployment. You can do the deployment and off hours for you as well. So if this worked the way it was supposed to, if I come back over here to my resource groups, search for the word demo, I should see a demo for the ASP.NET application. Now I created a different resource group for dev than I am for QA and than I am for also for production. That way I can completely kill my dev environment if I want to and spin it up fresh. Same thing with QA. And it doesn't impede or affect my production environment at all. Clicking on this guy here should then take me to a website that will allow you to see the changes that we just made or the application that I just produced running inside of Azure. When I do normal zero to DevOps and I don't have the network weirdness that happened inside of Visual Studio, this is exactly what I produce by hand for you. 
The only point that I do it by hand is so that you guys know that you can go and click your way through it. And then I basically show you this at the end, saying, hey, I showed you 20 minutes of what it takes to do it yourself, and you can, but you just type yo VSTS and you're done in about four minutes, and you just start checking in code. It's an open source tool, so you can go to yo VSTS right now and, and go to the Git repo, and you can start contributing. I only, it only does Node.js, Java, and .NET Core, because that's all I could learn before I did this first in New Zealand about a couple months ago. I don't know PHP, but I want it to do PHP. So if you're a PHP guru, please go to the repo and add the ability for us to do PHP. I'll help you do the pipeline part, like the build and the release. You just need to help me with the actual sample application that looks like this, but is all written inside of PHP or Go or whatever other Ruby or whatever other languages you guys want to be able to support. And even if you want it to go to Bluemix or to AWS, if we can build a pipeline inside of Visual Studio Team Services to do it, I'll help you guys do that as well. But I want this tool to be something that anyone can just type and then get your weekends and your nights back. Because a lot of you guys are just missing parts of this in your pipeline and you're killing yourselves with technical debt every sprint as you're trying to fight fires that you could actually put out yourself. One other thing I wanted to show you here real quick, and I said I was going to show you, is how we can customize our dashboard. So one of the things I can do is take this release, and I can put it on my overview dashboard. If I go back over here to my builds, I can take the build that was created for me as well, and I can pin that to the exact same place. And then if I go back over to my home dashboard here, what you're going to see is I'm going to have two new tiles here. This is the first dashboard that we saw, one for my build and one over here for my release. So I can always see them in one central location. The information that we're collecting from Application Insights, you don't always have to go to Azure to see it. I can click down here, say I want to add a new tile, and add a tile for Application Insights. So the data that I need to know how did my build go, how did my deployment go, and how are we doing in production can now all be surfaced on one dashboard so people don't have to jump from Visual Studio Team Services over to Azure and back to get the entire story. Okay? So that's what I wanted to show you, well half of what I wanted to show you. <laughs> the other half did not work and I will, I will talk to my machine about that later. Um, but let's go back real quick. I wanted to give you guys a couple of resources as well, right? So obviously please do the, uh, do the eval for me. And um, I'm going to blame all that on the fact that those are RC bits and when they're RTM everything's going to work just the way it's supposed to. Something weird did actually happen guys because I, like I said, I've done this at least a dozen times in Europe since November, and that's the first time it's actually failed. So it's, a, um, it's time for me to go home is basically what we're to say. Uh, so please uh, really think about Microsoft when you're building your DevOps pipeline for any language. Don't think that this just works for .NET. You saw that I had Java and Docker and, and Node in that pipeline that I can build for you. So please just go in and consider that. Thanks for having me, guys, and have a really Merry Christmas. Appreciate it. we have a break, I'll be more than happy to answer questions uh, during yeah, the break Yeah, were there any well. questions right now? Yeah, I'm willing to answer any of them. No questions? Okay. Yeah, go, you've got one. Oh. Good guy. Um, so I feel like I'm in the whole uh, of the line because I do everything else, uh, so Linux and... Uh, Perfect. Yes, um, it's, uh, so I, it's interesting that uh, you combine all of these different capabilities, uh, so that sounds like uh, the opposite of uh, loose coupling and integration. Uh, in, in the back of well, this product is uh, very tight, I guess. Are you able to actually have all the uh, uh, set of features that the competition has? Okay, good question. What, okay. What's the added value for it? All right, there's, there's a couple of things. So first thing you said is that it's tightly coupled, and I want to I address that one first, yeah, because, because it's not. It, it, that is an assumption, and it's a valid assumption. And it would be an assumption that I would make if I knew about TFS 2005 and 2008, because that was true then. Everything that we do here is surfaced through REST APIs and through webhooks, so all standard, dot, I mean, standard topologies. So for example, the tool that you just saw me run, Yo VSTS, is just using the REST API that is exposed in the back end of this tool set. Same API that you would use if you wanted to use something like Jenkins instead of our build system. You would use webhooks. And I want to show you that real quick because I think that'll help answer the question as well. If you go back over here and you type in uh, Jenkins, what you're going to see is that I've already written a blog post of how you can do a full end-to-end -end CI CD pipeline using Jenkins and Visual Studio Team Services. So all the open source tools you already want to know and use, because the, the problem here is, is that our build system in 2013 wasn't great. It was really, really hard to use unless you were a consultant. So people have already invested inside of Jenkins, and we can't expect our customers to throw away that investment to start using the rest of what I showed you. So what I wanted to demonstrate with this demo here was, the, the 
automatic deployment that I showed you into Azure, the work item tracking, the Kanban boards, the test kit, all that stuff if you want to use it, but still use Jenkins, you can. This replacement is just an example. Every part of Visual Studio Team Services could be replaced with any tool that you want. So if you're already betting all your money on Chef and you don't want to use Desire State Configuration, we're fine with that. If you want to use Octopus Deploy versus our release management, but use our source control and our automated build to feed into that, that's perfect. And as a matter of fact, they already have an extension in our workplace. So the tight coupling, we had to break that apart so that we could then allow you to pick and choose what we would call the best of breed is what most people say. But what I really think that you should be doing is doing the best fit for you and not best of breed. I have too many customers who have a best of breed DevOps pipeline and when I ask them, so what made this build system better than the other build system that you had? They'll rattle off all these features, and then I say, do you use any of those features? They're like, well, no. I'm like, well, then why did you go with that one versus the one that was doing the job perfectly for you as well? So what you want is the best fit, not best of breed necessarily, when you're building your DevOps pipeline. And what we said, how do we get the features that everyone else has was another point that you mentioned. When we first started working on Team Foundation Server, we were basically trying to do a little bit of everything uh, with one team. We have 37 teams dedicated to this one product now. We have a team that is literally trying to go and destroy Alassian when it comes to work item tracking. We have a team trying to destroy Jenkins when it comes to build. These teams are like little companies that do nothing but compete with the vertical out there that is trying to threaten our ability to be the best. So when you want to do best of breed or you want to do a complete solution, we still want you to end up with Microsoft. So we have this desire to make sure that if you want to compare us all up, no one will compare to us, period, because no one else has everything. But then you're going to go and say, well, then fine, let's go see if you're better than Jenkins. I honestly believe today that we are. 2013, we were not. Right? Just being completely transparent and open with you. Our new build system is insanely good, and I would encourage anyone to go and compare it. Do a true comparison, though. What I mean by that is go take a virgin machine and go install Jenkins like it was the very first time, and then go and set up our system for the very first time. It takes me three minutes to get everything working on .NET, it takes me three minutes to get everything working with Java. With Jenkins, you will not be done in three minutes, even if you've done it before. Ask me how I know, right? Because I do it over and over again, like religiously, to see what the true cost of ownership is. So I believe that we are, we are trying to compete on every vertical, and we're trying to compete horizontally like no one else in the, company, in the industry. What other questions? Did I answer all your questions? Okay. What other questions do we have? Sure. How do you say that if it's comparing ratings, if you have now, it's better? Yes. Would you say the same thing about the backlog management you have now compared to Zula? I believe that our backlog management, no, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very valid question. We do something internally at Microsoft called Bake Offs, where we basically take our product and we demo it against our competitor's product. The very first time I participated in one of these Bake Offs, I was demoing Visual Studio Team Services. And I love demoing this product, and I felt bad for the other guy. My poor guy. I'm just going to slaughter this guy, right? And it was funny because he's my manager. He's like, just bring it, Donna. Right? Because what he had done is gone and basically immersed himself in the, the Alassian Kool-Aid. Right? What, why do they love this stuff? Why is it so good? And when we went and did the first bake-off, we had Microsoft internal people vote on which one was better. Almost everyone voted for Alassian. And it was heart-wrenching, right? It, what was really good about it is we all got pissed off. No, like, literally. Like, we left that meeting, and the emails that were flying around, like, how is this possible? How are we letting these people do this to us? This is not okay. That, for example, when I went to the Kanban board, and I clicked, and I was able to create a branch, that is a direct result of getting our ass kicked by Alassian when we did the bake-off, because they had that and we didn't. Their Kanban board six months ago was better than ours. It's not anymore. So the reason why I think that we're able to do that is because we do these religiously and we see where our competition is. We literally try to drink their Kool-Aid and understand why are people using those products. And then we go back in and we try to make our products better. And some of the ideas we lift strictly from there, that, that creating a branch from a work item, that was theirs. It was brilliant and we needed it and now we have it. So yes, I think that when you want to go and compare our tools against them, we do it all the time. I encourage you to go to it. And if you say that no Donovan, yours are still not good enough, it's at Donovan Brown on Twitter. <laughs> now I am dead serious. You think it's a joke? I am dead serious. Say, Donovan, I did the comparison. I still think Jira is better, and this is why. Let me know that, and I will take it right. As a matter of fact, what I will probably do is get Aaron Brewer on that call, because Aaron owns all of our Agile planning tools. He is very active 
on, uh, on Twitter, they would be very interested in any feedback that you have that you think they are still kicking our butt. And if they are, we need to know about it because we're doing what we believe is the best that we can do for you based on our assumptions, based on our knowledge, based on our feedback from user voice. And if that's wrong, we'll never know unless you tell us. Right? And then we're going to go off and use our competitive nature, use our competitive resources. We're the largest computer company in the world. If you want us to do something, we have the resources to do it. But we don't know everything that you want us to do unless you tell us. A lot of people will just, ah, oh, they'll never get it. And they don't even take the time to tell us what it is that they don't think they were ever going to get. Right? So please, do the comparisons, give us your feedback, and we'll, you'll see us take action on it. It's a different Microsoft, I promise you.